This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So let's go through and have a look at a really small bit of an accounting standard entirely to do with disclosure. So there'll be no computations required of you whatsoever within the exam. And all you need to understand essentially is why do we have IFRS 12? Why do we have this standard that encourages additional disclosure of interest in other entities? So, so what essentially is it all about? What's the objective and what's the scope? Well, first of all, let's think about what we've done. We've gone through there and we've looked at various different group types of structure. So we've looked at your very basic structure whereby we had a parent and we had a subsidiary. We looked at a more complex group structure whereby we had a parent, a sub, a sub subsidiary. And then on top of that, we then looked at it whereby there was, there was a D-shaped group as well, wasn't there? Uh, we've gone through as well and spoken about influence of an associate. We've spoken about control that you could have and, and joint control. So that there's all sorts of different accounting treatment depending upon the level of ownership and the, the rights and the powers that you have with regard to directing or having influence over those activities. So the reason why we have IFRS 12 is that it enables the users of your financial statements to start to look at those entities that, that you have accounted for and look to the nature and the risk associated with that investment. So it goes through there and gives you extra information uh, on the statement of financial position, the statement of financial performance, so your profit or loss, and also your cash flows. Because we've gone through maybe and consolidated a subsidiary, uh, which is fine. Uh, we've done all the correct accounting treatment. We've looked at IFRS 8, haven't we, in F1, and looked at how we then disaggregated everything to start looking at how things then get disclosed separately based upon the operating segment. So giving more information to the users of the accounts to help them understand past performance and go through there and understand the risk and reward. But, but here, what we're now starting to think more of it is about your joint ventures, about where you have maybe joint control or, or maybe where you have influence over an associate. Because when you look at equity accounting, which is what we do, isn't it, essentially, if we have joint control uh, over a joint venture or if we have significant influence over an associate, we, we just see one line item, don't we? And that doesn't really help us, does it, address those issues there. It doesn't help you look at the, the nature of, of why you have accounted for that sub or why you have accounted for that business as such it doesn't tell you any of the risk that you are faced with uh, by looking at the associates uh, or by looking at the the entity over which you have joint control and it doesn't give you any information or breakdown about the assets the liabilities the income the expense or the cash flows of the joint venture or of the associates so essentially all the standard wants to do is give us extra disclosure uh, about the joint venture, about the associate, and it also wants you to explain essentially why you have treated it as such. So the standard will go through there and apply if you have an interest in a subsidiary, so if you have control. Uh, also, if you have a joint arrangement, so you have joint control under a, a joint venture or maybe even a, a joint operation, or if you have an associated company. Okay, If you have none of those interest in any of the entities then you do not need to worry about this as an accounting standard from an exam perspective i think you may get one question if that at all uh, which just goes through there and, and asks you to understand why we have this accounting standard it's essentially to give you additional disclosure about what you see with regards to your associate and entities under which we have joint control to be able to help the user of the account understand the risks and get that little bit more detail, isn't it? Okay, so what we're going to go through and do, it talks about unconsolidated structured entities as well. I'm not particularly worried about that. That's whereby you don't have control, you don't have joint control, uh, you don't have any influence uh, and you do not consolidate that, that entity at all. Uh, so maybe you might need to put in additional disclosure there for, for some form of investments that you have. But other than that, I'm not too worried about it. Okay, it's all about subs, joint control, and associates. And what we're going to go through and do uh, it is, is we're going to start thinking about the significant judgments and assumptions that you have made. Uh, so it will go through there and give you information about the control that you have over the entity. 
uh, whereby you have joint control uh, and also if you like the the type of joint arrangement because don't forget uh, you've got a, a joint venture that can be either a joint operation uh, or it could be the a joint venture couldn't it so, so you need to go through there and explain that the reasons why you have accounted for it separately so for each entity that, that you have an interest in you need to show or demonstrate why you have control over that particular entity or why you have joint control or why you have if you like significant influence again if you look at the words there it talks about significant judgments and assumptions that, that you have made uh, so th there's no specific rules are there it, it's a very international standard in that it, it's very subjective isn't it in terms of how you assess significant judgments and significant assumptions essentially it's all down to, to the complexity if it's complex if it takes you a while as an accountant or the auditors to determine how to go through there and treat that investment in an entity then that will be there wouldn't it? a significant judgment and a significant assumption and therefore would require disclosure okay uh, what we're going to go through and do uh, is we're going to go through and just look at some of the disclosures just to brighten it up and keep it a little bit more interesting uh, and look there at the TUI group, which is a European travel based company. OK, so if you're in the UK, uh, you have maybe been on holiday with, with Thompson Holidays, uh, flown with Thompson Airlines, and they are all part of the TUI group. OK, so they will have lots of investments. They will have investments in hotels and airlines you name it okay so they would need to start looking there and explaining to the users of the accounts uh, the judgments that they've made in determining control in determining joint control and determining influence uh, talking about the type of joint arrangements uh, and helping the user understand a bit more detail about the associate and about that joint venture okay so what you've got uh first bit that, that i've just gone through and pulled out is looking at the methods of consolidation and the first bit that we're going to consider there is control. OK, I've not included any of this within the financial within your set of notes. It's just there is a little bit of a real world perspective. You can do it for any listed company that, that you so wish to do so. OK, find the IFRS 12 disclosures and work your way through them. OK, so here, first of all, it, it talks about control. And I think what you can see there within that first paragraph, uh, it tells us the consolidated financial statements include all significant subsidiaries whether they are directly or indirectly controlled okay so it doesn't just have to be parent sub it can be parent sub 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 okay so that what that paragraph is talking about there and it, it goes through there and explains how they have control in the second paragraph uh, it's there by means of a direct or indirect majority of voting rights okay so it's not just down to the percentage ownership it's determined based upon the voting rights, which is something that we spoke about as we've gone through all aspects of group accounts, isn't it? If we then think a little bit further down, I think it brings in talks about significant influence. So is it in that fifth paragraph? Associates for which the TUI group is able to exert significant influence uh, over the financial and operating policy uh, are accounted for using the equity method. OK, so it tells us the accounting whereby if we have significant influence, but it hasn't told us what significant influence is, it does just afterwards, doesn't it, in the, in the rest of the paragraph. As a rule, significant influence is assumed if TUI directly or indirectly holds voting rights of 20 to less than 50%. Okay, there we go. And then the last bit, it talks there, if you like, about joint control. Uh, so again, it tells us there in that next paragraph, Stakes and joint ventures are also measured using the, the equity method. Uh, a joint venture is a company managed jointly by the TUI group with one or several partners based upon a contractual agreement. Remember, that was important, wasn't it? With regards to a joint venture, you had to have a contractual agreement in place, wasn't it? Didn't necessarily have to be 50-50, could be 60-40, but provided that, that the decisions are made together, uh, there's a contracted agreement that says if you both agree something happens if one of you disagrees nothing happens okay so you have the is it joint control okay uh, excellent and at the very bottom in terms of that paragraph joint ventures also include companies in which the TUI group holds a majority or minority of the voting rights 
output in which decisions about the relevant activities may only be taken on a unanimous basis. So that was the key word, wasn't it? Uh, that we looked at it in that joint arrangement chapter. Okay, a unanimous basis. Okay, i.e., all come together, something happens, someone disagrees, nothing happens. Okay, uh, I just want to take it just a little bit further, uh, just going through and just looking at some of the disclosures. Uh, so here, what you can see is they've gone through there and put in a disclosure note that shows that the names and the percentage ownerships uh, even mentions, doesn't it, right at the top there, uh, with the definitions of IFRS 12, uh, of looking at associates and the joint ventures. And it tells you that the nature of the business as well to help you understand, if you like, the, the risks associated with that entity. OK, uh, then what you've got is it goes through and just gives you extra information. So here. It talks about information of material associates. Remember, it only spoke about significant items, material items. That's what you'd be concerned with, wouldn't it, as an investor? You get enough disclosure as it is. This is just even more. Uh, so here, it's just giving you information about the three material associates that we have in terms of revenue, profits, the assets, and the liabilities. Okay. Uh, again, moving on. Uh, you've got the, the the combined financial information and material joint ventures. So again, uh, you've got your joint ventures, equity accounted. Uh, what you've got here again at the top it is all the, the SFP information. And at the bottom, you've got the statement of profit or loss information. OK, uh, they, they've included a little bit more, haven't they? You know, if we go back to the associates, we only saw revenues, profit or loss and OCI, didn't we, for each of those associates? But that's only essentially because we only have a little bit of influence, isn't it? Uh, with joint ventures, you have joint control, don't we? So there's a more significant stake that, that you have usually within that business. So they've given you a bit more information about those joint ventures with regards to their profit or loss. And also, uh, if you like, a little bit extra to, to do with the statement of financial position. OK, so it's not going to ask you specifically in the exam what must be disclosed, but I just want to give you an appreciation as, as to why that is important. OK, so if you go through there and look at the joint ventures that we have, uh, you can see there. if you look at that middle one, is it the TUI cruises? Uh, you know, if you look at the turnover there, uh, the turnover has increased dramatically, hasn't it, from from last year's September 14 results to, to this year's. September 15 results. OK, so has clearly had a really, really, really good year. You know, you wouldn't really see that, would you very much if you were to just look at the one line item within the statement of profit or loss uh, that said share of profit or loss of joint venture. OK, so it just goes through there and, and gives you that little bit more information. OK, excellent. Other than that, uh, I wouldn't be too worried about what, what you're going to get within the exam. As I said, there's one question potentially that, that may crop up uh, and then all they've done is neglecting the numerical disclosures that they've also put in if you want uh, a little bit more qualitative disclosure okay more non-computational to do with the risks associated again significant risks associated with, with the joint venture so there it says no contingent liabilities existed uh, in respect of the associates uh, however there were some that arose with respect to the joint ventures, okay, uh, and also talks there about leases that are in place again. So off balance sheet lease commitments that are there with regard to the joint venture, okay. So it, again, it's disclosure. I do believe that we're getting to a point whereby there is now too much disclosure within the financial statements, but that's uh, an issue for another day, isn't it? Okay. For now, I just want you to go through there and appreciate why we have IFRS and what the purpose of IFRS 12 actually is.